Hello, hello, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, good wherever you are from. Hello and welcome to the last podcast left where we take the LPL to the next level in the LPL podcast. The dive, they took all our fancy equipment. The OPL show, they started it, burnt it to the ground, and then they disappeared. Euphoria, our sound cards, that's where they've all gone. So we're the budget form of the podcast pilot right now until we get all our equipment. We're all sitting at home in our couches in our living rooms, in our bedrooms, in the toilet where Raz is right now, just Wait waiting to record this fantastic show and bring it to you guys back at home. I'm Matthew Stewart. I'll be hosting this podcast. Joining me for today's show is going to be Brento, Raz, Muhammad. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, man. And you know what? I'm just happy that at least in our pilot episodes, we don't have a camera on our faces because I get to n- wear this nice pajama. It's nice. You don't get to see it. Yeah. Maybe in the future, if it takes place in my home, but for now, it's cute as heck. I mean, look, Raz, nobody really wants to see you (laughs) in your pajamas, sitting on the toilet. Okay, look, we don't need that visual image just yet, but there was Clement Chu. How are you doing today, Clement? I'm doing fine. It's just good to sit back in my own house and not be at the office. So, you know, I'm cool with the setup. Fantastic. Well, let's get straight into this. As you all know, the LPL is going to be starting tomorrow. It's going to be a Monday where this one kick starts. We're recording this on a Sunday morning here in Shanghai. And the first thing I want to talk to you guys about is going to be MSI. Because, of course, the LPL has taken home the trophy. We won MSI, guys. Yeah, no one else. Yep, it took three years to get here. But we finally did it. And I actually think this is going to be like a watershed moment looking back towards it. I think this is the trajectory where LPL really does start to encroach on the LCK and start to make headways at Worlds as well. Yeah, I think for me, a uh, big story was the fact that we already we always pinned RNG as the super team right from week one, but then we started losing faith. All right, We all lost faith. It wasn't looking too good because they didn't have U- Udi, Uzi to start. <laughs> But then the road went through playoffs when Uzi came in on Chinese New Year's, and they just got better and better as a team. So you're right about the fact that they had an identity around team fighting. Uh, this time around, it just felt like not only did they have the team fighting, because like that was a consistent thing with RNG between MSI and last year's Worlds, but it felt like they just had the talent throughout. Uh, I, I felt like the, di- the diversity, they were just prepared with talent side, diversity in drafting, and Kingzone specifically could not handle them. I mean, remember that yeah, throughout, the... The, throughout the RNG run, you have to keep note that not many people expected RNG to be the ones that represented the LPL. All the way to about the semifinals when the Shy came up with this injury, it was all about Invictus Gaming being the team that led the LPL at MSI. Yeah, true. Definitely true. I feel like I feel really bad for Invictus Gaming, but hopefully now that they have the Shy back in the roster, they can kind of right those wrongs down the line. And my thing on this is, uh, I think that's a good thing for... Th- LPL teams that go internationally because largely for us it comes down to we already know which teams are going to go out internationally like RNG, uh, EDG and when they go through there's always that question of like well are they ever going to beat a Korean team but this time even when it got to playoff time we all expected IG. RNG was a very strong team as well. Uh, There was competition in the sense that uh, Rogue Warriors, EDG that they could come out when it comes to playoff time. And so it really set the expectation of strong competition in the top side of the LPL that when they did go internationally, they were already prepared. There was never a question of like having to level up to a Korean team come international. It was more so once they got the ball rolling and they weren't jet lagged, that they were well prepared enough. Which is what I want to ask you, Clement, because we saw RNG, their finish at MSI was fantastic to watch. Uzi looked on form, the entire team meshed together, but the beginning at MSI, things were incredibly shaky for the LPL roster. And I think that's just mainly due to not being able to practice. They came in late on the play. But what I was really excited about this run from RNG is how confident they were in actually taking down a Korean team. If you look at their documentary, they were actually looking to finish off King Zone in the semifinals. That was how confident they were. Kesman said, you know what, it's going to be a 90 to 10 chance that we take out this korean team and i think we have to look at the reasons behind that why were they were they so confident you touched about it raz and it really is the team fighting this is the first time that like a region is going to dominate lck in that respect rng just said if it comes down to 5v5 we're going to run these people off the map we don't even care and that confidence turned them 
into this big machine where they really weren't afraid of playing up to Kingsong. And that a confidence seemed to have allowed RNG to pick up not only the LPL title last split, but now the MSI title this year. Moving back into the regular split of the LPL, LPL teams, knowing that a local team has been able to pick up an MSI title, will be looking towards the world champion. Starting with you, Raz, how do the LPL win worlds this year? Ooh, okay, how do they win worlds? Well, I think that the biggest, the, the start is going to be regionally, right? To get to the, get to get to worlds, you have to perform. I would say if you get first place, you're already off to an incredible start. It's saying that you actually do have a name of being the, first, the best team in the world. Because LPL is already, of course, taking rift rivals i mean first of all if they can take the next one that's gonna be sick we're gonna talk about it a little bit later if they are already coming off of msi taking first place there that we've already etched the fact that lpl could be the most competitive region globally that if you come out to worlds first place then the expectations already that you are the team to be so for me how are they going to win worlds well if you're edg be the same team that you have been coming outside of your domestic split and i feel like who you are as a team what you're coming into the international with or at least your identity just play the same game there's nothing that you have to change so i feel like we've gotten to a place which is so damn comfortable i'm happy with it that you can just be comfortable with your play style just because it's been tried and tested in your own region <laughs> so i'm gonna chime in here man i hate to be the party pooper but i actually think uh the the goal for world worlds is probably next year and the reason for what that the heck? Thank you very much. get him out of here that's all the time that's oh, all the time for get this man out that's all the time for coming please please leave no 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 you, you you have to let me finish man you have to let me finish and this is my reasoning okay so this year is going to be played in korea it's going to be i i believe it's seoul or busan but the way that you beat a Korean team at a world is that you isolate Lin, you take away their partners. The absolute best scenario for L LPL to win worlds is you get into a semifinals. There's two LPL teams and there's only one LCA LCK team. They don't have anyone to scrim. They don't have a reliable partner where they can go in and kind of like share strategies with like that. And that's how you kind of win them. Like if you've been in a world setting, you know, that teams that scrim together go out together. And the best way for LCK to fall is you, if you can isolate them. Now, the reason I say it's going to be really hard this year is because when you're playing on your home turf and you go to a team and you tell them, like, hey, man, the pride of Korea is on this tournament. You have to scrim with us. That team's not going to turn you down. It, it's, it's a little bit different if the tournament's held somewhere else. Like, if it was held in the LMS, if it was held in the LPL, then those Korean teams are not going to get scrim pra practice. But this time around, man, it, it's really hard to isolate them. That's really interesting because I have the feeling that no matter where you go to, especially for the World Championship, where the LCK and the LPL do have three representatives if history repeats itself, you're still going to have two teams you can scrim against no matter what when you get into that grand final unless two LCK teams are going up against one another. By then, the LPL's hopes have been crushed all the way in the semifinals. And here's the thing about this yeah, requirement. But you have to isolate them. Because, like, all of this is in the idea that once they get to the semifinals, you only have four teams, and you just, like, you're saying that it's a numbers game. They don't have really anybody to scrim with. I think that a lot of that comes down to the group stage. Because if we remember, cast our minds back to last year when Samsung got the victory, a lot of their growth and development came in their group stage. That they really suffered in their own group because they didn't have strong enough team fighting. Out of the group stage, going into knockout stage, they were the Korean team that super buffed their team fighting had stronger communication and were able to take down Chinese teams to get to the finals and to get the victory. So I would say that the adaptation that the Korean teams have, they can move away from group stage, come into knockout stage just fine. So that's what I'm worried about. I think the next step for LPL teams is still be able to conquer that, right? If we have an identity of team fighting, which you've always had, um, that if we go into knockout stage, we still have to be a better uh, or at least a good enough team in terms of communication, uh, rotation like RNG showcased in MSI to be able to match them while still hitting our key core identity. Well, for Clement, yeah. you think that it's all about you know not taking on the LCK teams on their home turf, which is going to be this year at the World Championship. For Raz, you think it's all about the group stage for the LCK and the LPL teams. And speaking of the group stages, that's what's going to take place tomorrow here in Shanghai. The LPL is going to start. The group stage is going to start. 
And let's talk about the conference system that the LPL has, because we have been divided between East and West Conference since the start of the first split this year, and that's going to continue on into summer split. You go for it, Coming. You actually take this. All right, all right, all right. The, the main thing about the conference system is that we just have too many teams, so we need to break these into two sides to really shorten down on the season length. And the way it works is that we're going to have a round robin for each side. The first third of the split is going to be between their own conference, and the middle half is going to be between be between the two conferences. And then we go back to another round robin where it is teams playing within their own conference. So it really sucks to be in a conference that has a lot of the stacked teams, and you do have a better chance into playoffs if your conference is slightly weaker. Yeah, and just to hit on that fact, 14 teams means that that's going to be a hell of a lot of games, and you don't have the whole buff of, like, Europe or North America. We have best of ones. It is best of threes for a lot of these games. Uh, so all of these are best of threes through and through, so cross-conference meaning that you only, you only face the opposing side once is a key factor of it. So stay tuned, because even for the English broadcast, we have four days, but the LPL runs for six days for a lot of teams. So it's a really grueling run during the regular season. Teams are now moving into their home stadiums as well. I mean, last split, we already saw Snake move to Chongqing, LGD move over towards Hangzhou, even Ongji towards Chengdu. And a couple of teams are now moving towards their home arenas as well. I know you're going to touch on a few more points as well there, Clement, but on top of that, Moving into these home arenas, getting the home crowd fans into your arenas and, and traveling to go to a lot of your games is going to affect some of these teams too. Yeah, and this is a big part about it is that we've moved the days of travel for LPL teams now to close to three days away. So what that means is through a week, uh, they're, they're going to have three days where they actually have to travel to other arenas. And uh, it, it's kind of that interesting aspect about franchising that overall there's going to be more cash coming into it. You know, the entire league is better. But it, I think the difference between teams having good adaptation to travel and good logistics is really going to start showing itself. Like if you spend that much time away from your home arena, you better have a very good remote reporting staff and, and the analytical staff that you can rely on because a lot of time is going to be lost for these teams. Yeah, and I'm going to hit on the fact that I feel like just the idea of having a home stadium for a gaming event, people will be like, well, wait, wait a minute. Like, you have noise-canceling headsets. The crowd, even though they're going to be on your side, there's always a question. And I was pretty skeptic, too, when it came to the first split of franchising. But... When teams started playing through it, specifically Snake, I think Snake in Chongqing was a really big uh, proponent of what a home audience can do. Because even when Snake was going up against RNG, EDG, Snake had a lot of fans by their side and they were taking a lot of victories. I think when Snake went on the road going up against teams like LGD, OMG, and even though those teams were underperforming, uh, when they were finally going on the road and going into playoffs, they were not performing as well as they were within their own group, within their own stadium. And it kind of showcased what a home stadium can do because teams that just literally played in Chongqing were playing worse. That was just what was happening. So I think it's really interesting. You can call it a social experiment if you want. Now that we have new teams coming through and it seems like the, the way the LPL is progressing is that more and more teams are going to have stadiums for themselves. It was even announced that Jingdong was going to be going to Beijing as well. It's going to be awesome to see how that impacts a team's play when they move out abroad. It certainly will. And I know you and I, Raz, both got to travel to a couple of different cities. I went over to Hangzhou, got to speak to the LGD players, got to talk to PYL, and he mentioned how much of an impact it has had on the team. Not only do they get to play in front of their home audience more, and they get more fans cheering for them, that gives them a big cons confidence booster, but they feel hungry, he said. Hungry to go to the opposition's arenas, go to their home venues, and take a win off of them. It's more of a pride thing. They win the pride for their fans and take it back to their city. So I know that a lot of the LPL teams are excited. A lot of the players are incredibly excited to be playing in their home arenas and travel to other arenas as well. But that being said, some teams are locked into their conferences at the moment in the sense that no matter what, they can't go from east to west. But at the moment, since not every team has their home stadium, some teams can get shuffled around. We did see that with Rogue Warriors and BLG effectively swapping conferences and Vici and TOP effectively swapping conferences with the group draw. But that's the only changes we have going into Summer Split. Yeah, let me touch on this one and second. Overall, I think... I want to say that for me going into this, like 
a lot of people will wonder about who, what strength between BLG and Rogue Warriors, like who's the stronger team. During playoff times, I felt like BLG were really hitting their stride. I felt like at the end of split, BLG were getting better. In the playoff times, BLG were getting better, and there was some tilt factor in that best of five. I would caution you guys to watch that one because that was that was insanity. Uh, <laughs> and then in the Demacia Cup, we also got to see what BLG were doing. So I think BLG, if we're comparing them to Rogue Warriors, that a team that were slumping at the backside of the split, uh, I would say that BLG was a stronger team. And they're going to the Eastern Conference that was already seeming like a stronger region. So I, I, I feel like this is really tough for the teams in the Eastern region. Yeah, if you're Suning and Jingdong and you're looking at what's happening right now, you're, you're really pissed because you, you, you have to think in the back of your head that you would have a better chance in the Western region. And looking at these conferences, the question for us is kind of like, are we going to see the same thing that happened in spring where the top three teams of the East went into the hood of the Western region and went 21 and zero, like a hundred percent win rate throughout the intra-conference. That's how much the difference, that's how steep the gap was between these two sides. And we're, we're looking at this and we kind of feel like in the Eastern region, in the top heavy side of the portion, that that may very well happen again this time around. Yeah, uh, definitely with just RNG and Invictus Gaming remaining on Eastern Conference, I feel like RNG and IG are just by far the strongest teams in the LPL as it is. The only team that I look into the West that I think they're going to be able to take them down in one set would perhaps be Edward Gaming. And even then, I would really want for Haro to start learning. I know we're going to be discussing a lot of these teams and players going forward, but Haro for me, I, I didn't. when we were in Week 7, we were doing our jungle tier list, I had him as outside of the top 10. If he gets better, great, excellent. EDG has a chance going up against BLG, and, or at least Invictus Gaming and RNG. I really want to touch on what you just mentioned there, Raz, that it is a new split. Things have changed, not only in the teams moving into different conferences, but teams moving into home venues, but the patch coming into this split has changed significantly. We've seen some funky and crazy things happening in solo queue. I know that Rusty's been playing a ton of games because he is so excited about everything that's changing in the bottom lane as well. But Connor, I want to get your thoughts first. Biggest changes coming into this split of the pack, what are they going to be? All right, so the biggest thing is what everyone is talking about on Reddit. It is the bruiser changes. And we've actually started to see that even on 8.10 in the Demacia Cup where people were running the Yasuos into the ball lane, especially Abel. Got to give him a shout out right there. And we have to take a look at the, uh, the reasons and I think the outcomes that that's going to have on the LPL. The reasons, of course, is like the AD changes now. Uh, 80s at the start of the game they do a lot less damage and it's also harder for them to survive an all-in just because sustain was hit as well your 80 level doesn't really reach uh, previous levels until you hit level six or level seven so that's been a big change there and we're gonna see start seeing things like Aurelia in the bot lane we're gonna start seeing things like Yasuo who is already there and even some of the more funky stuff like the Wukong's there as well <laughs> So this is a massive change, and I think the outcome is that um, the early game is actually now going to be much more important. Like, these are very snowball, snowball-y lane assignments. Like, if you've seen a Yasuo Alistar lane, they get an early kill, they get a flash, then it snowballs into a level 6 insta-gib, and then the game's just completely out of control. Like, this is going to be much more focused on laning phase. You really don't have the hyperscaling of the triple crit items anymore to scale up to so teams like I, I would say like rogue warriors are probably going to be a little bit uh nerfed because of this they, they're going to have to put more eggs into the pre-50 minute and here's the thing for me to touch on that just before i move on to what i think is really good uh, i think it's not a 100 percent thing i don't think every competitive game is going to be uh, we're going to see a bruiser in the bottom lane right now we've seen a few national leagues to play on 8.11 and specifically like Oceania was able to get it on the patch first so like Orin is a champion that I got to see there which is going to be hilarious I know a lot of solo queue or at least the 80 carries are picking up Orin uh Mordecai's or Alistar is a fun lane that I saw in Korean solo queue so wh all, while all of that is happening I still think we'll see the Gwinsu's 80 carries like Kai'Sa uh, coming forward Kai'Sa, Varus still have a decent enough or Varus still has decent enough lane uh, while Kaisa has great scaling and range that can make the team fights a little bit more easier to play around. So the range champions are still fine as long as you have Gwinsu's. Um, 
You're right about Yasuo being a terror. Like, the biggest thing, like, I don't even... If he doesn't get picked in the bottom lane, the 80 uh, mid lane, Yasuo's just as fine because his crit and how he utilizes the new crit that comes along... Because, you're right, IE doubles the crit. Yasuo already has double in his passive, so you just end up getting quadruple <laughs> crit, crit just based off that alone, I think. And, and he has true damage as well based off of the IE, so, like, that's going to be incredible. You already see, like, Faker and Bjergsen rolling around with that. Uh, but... Back to like what I think is going to be really important. Like we didn't get to really see 8.10 Demonstia Cup. We saw 8.10 Jungle changes were there. Runic Echo was, was a really big change as well. Talia got hit since well you can say hit, but she's no longer a mid laner. She's a jungler now. So we're going to be seeing a lot more AP junglers with Talia coming on the forefront. We're going to be seeing Talia primarily. Uh, we're going to be seeing Nidalee coming back because the J Runic Echo changes came from 60 AP to 80 AP, and they reverted to the changes from 8.10 where it was uh, lost chapter which was just a poor recipe so now it's just better coming into 8.11 to build so i actually think that we're going to be seeing a resurgence of uh ap's coming into the jungle and it's still level two nonsense coming in that route so i, I it's gonna be a hilarious patch to be watching lpl on I mean, remember, one of the big sleepers that a lot of the LCK teams, and especially talking about on Invin at the moment, is Ezreal. Ezreal was not hit too hard by this patch, already had a good item build, and was creeping up as one of the more popular AD carries during MSI. So that's one of the AD carries you can watch. AP carries were buffed a while ago in terms of their damage that they deal to turrets, so you don't, you, you don't really require that siege potential that AD carries used to bring back when they didn't deal as much damage to turrets, but that's only a very small change that people are talking about. And as you mentioned, Raz, the OPL has been all, already playing on this patch. We've seen on in the bottom lane. We saw Order, a team in the OPL, try to pick up a, a late game hyperscaling AD carry of Kog'Maw. It didn't work out too well for them, but this meta is really going to evolve and grow. And I quite honestly like the change that's coming about. No longer does it feel like, you know, that's a fixed meta where you, okay, top side of the map, you have to play for nice and early. Bottom side of the map, you're our late game scaling insurance. We rely on you only if we get past 30 minutes, and then we'll try and protect you then. Now it really feels like everyone's working towards the same goal. Either we're all working towards scaling up into late game, or we're all working up to try and take down teams as early as possible. And Frosker and I had a quick conversation about this, which I want to get your thoughts on comment before we move on, which is it really feels like the meta changes are going to help the LPL so much because games are becoming a lot shorter. Not many teams can rely on that late game insurance policy. So all these aggressive laning phase teams like Invictus Gaming, like RNG, can just snowball ahead even faster with the picks they can go for now. I definitely do see the game being more fragmented around individual skill and the game pacing has moved up incredibly fast. So just to preface this, We've seen the game, uh, the kills per minute actually shoot up by about 13% just in Demacia Cup alone. And a lot of that has to do with how much early contests are going on right now. You fight around Scuttle, you fight around Storm Razor, the first item spike there to really just empower yourself. It's such a powerful item at that first item spike. And I, I really don't think that the games are going to go as long. I really don't think late game compositions are going to be as good and a lot of the test is going to be on the uh the laning strength and the individual prowess of these players that being said however i do want to say that i think a lot of changes are coming down the line i think what we're doing this split is we're going to try to move all of the big things very far away from playoffs so we can have a very fair environment for worlds so if you look ahead just a little bit at patch 6.12 and you see they're adding two new items taking away the banner and i i think this is going to be a really turbulent for first four weeks like there's no real say on how the meta is going to settle up definitely we have to see how how much it mixes up as well and i want to get your final thoughts raz on this because you mentioned on in the bottom lane and that's something that rusty and i have tried we've seen it played in the opl as you mentioned and that's a little bit scary for LPL as a region. When you look at the likes of SMLZ and Uzi as superstar AD carries that nobody wants to mess with, and suddenly you're like, okay, he's playing on. That's not the hyper carry we really want these two star players on. And that could also hinder the LPL as much as we think that's going to help them out with the meta. What are your thoughts on that, Raz? I would agree with that. Uh, I think it's, I wouldn't see it as, you know, teams like RNG playing Orn uh, as AD carries because there'll still be teams 
that center their primary carry position to be their 80 carries. Like, I, I, there will be Definitely. stubbornness, exactly. So, like, I think it'll make it easier for teams around that playing up against them. I think if you're looking into the LPL specifically, if you're, like, VG Gaming, suddenly you run an Orn or Mordekaiser bottom lane to nullify an 80 carry from the enemy team. Like, that's actually really scary for uh, teams if you're trying to strategize versus a VG. And you know that they say, oh, well, we cannot handle this enemy bottom lane. And if you're Snake, and Snake, they had a week in cross-conference where they actually just com got completely blasted versus teams that had an incredible AD carries. Like, those are real settings that you have regionally that you say that, yeah, sure, there's more diversity in the bottom lane. There's more ways to nullify uh, a bottom an AD carry strength. So that's something you have to keep aware of, be cognizant of. And I don't want the patch to change too much based off of what happened in 8.11 because not all the data has come through. And it could very easily be that teams understand how to play around double melee bottom lane with uh, Kai'Sa Ezreal. Like, it's already still not being 100% played. So as long as people adapt to the patch and then we end up patching it later down the road, that's great. But if the game keeps getting updated patch after patch with these long ass patches and i'm like all right hold on <laughs> let's calm down a minute wait hold on hold it's on take, it's gonna take some time for these teams to adapt to that i mean we have some other strategies coming out we've seen a couple of regions try to throw a brom in the mid lane get a graves farming oh in the jungle God. farm in the mid lane as well but we're gonna we're gonna have to oh. keep track of that we can't we can't speculate too heavily on what the patch is going to change for the lpl we're gonna have to watch the first few weeks and see how teams adapt as they move closer towards cross-conference. That's where it seems like the LPL always dictates what the meta is going to look like when they go into their semifinals and go into the finals, and then into international events. But moving away from the patch notes, I want to start about the roster changes we've had in the LPL so far, because things like Uzi not playing for the first couple of weeks is going to be quite standard. We didn't see him play much during the Master Cup. We saw Abel play mostly for RNG. That's just going to happen. Abel's going to get his chance to play for the first few games, get a bit of a test, a bit of a feel for RNG, allow Uzi to practice a bit more, then he'll come in towards cross-conference and later on in the split. But there have been some big changes. I want to start with you first, Raz, because I know you want to talk about Team WE, because it seems like the boys, they're back together, Raz. Yeah, I mean, last split, it was like, where the heck is Kandi? Because if you don't remember, 2017 was the year of WE, where Spring's finals was legitimately the Spring finals MVP was Kandi. And Kandi went into Worlds as... One of the strongest, no, the strongest LPL jungler going into the event. And then he's just vanished. Like the Avatar. Like what the heck happened? So if you lose the Avatar, the world is going to get in disarray. And it was just miraculously that WWE found strength in Shea that split. That they were any good. So the fact that now going into the summer split, that now if Shea assumedly is still on form. And you have Condi rounding out the jungle then WE, you would have to expect to be rounding up the top. They were barely coming into fourth place, and they got smashed uh, by RNG 2-0, like in the like, playoffs, right? And even though some of them were close games, you add Conti to the mix, excellent. The only question I have now, Clement, and I'm going to be throwing this to you. I'm a pseudo-host suddenly. Why do you have these subs? This is not the end Wait of the road. <laughs> And that's the big question I have for W because you have to understand that they brought in Pepper from FPX and Imp from LGT to supplement their roster. And honestly, the way I see it is that WE, you know, we've heard a couple of rumors here and there, but that their team is not gelling as well together. They don't have the same chemistry as they did in 2017, and they're looking for backup plans. And we also have to remember that the Condi return is not certified. Like they've already, they, they've actually put out Condi coming back to the team last split as well. And as we all know, that didn't really happen. So for me, Team WE is, is I think they're going for from like a more transformative phase. And I'm going to comment on them when they actually settle with their starting roster. I'm not, I'm not sold on what's happening right now. <laughs> You're right about settling, and that's where my question comes in because, like, it you definitely like. There's a lot of things we don't know. That's fair, but what I do know is Pepper was the starting player at PX. What I do know was Imp was the franchise yeah. player for LGD. These players are not going to settle coming onto a new team onto WE as bench players. Like, this is definitely like if I'm oh, these players, I wouldn't say that about it, man. Well, if hold I'm a on, franchise player on LGD that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fair. All right, wait a second. <laughs> Imp has not looked great. I, I, I have to I have to remind everyone, but this is in 2014. You know, he's not the cutesy Imp that's going to roll around in the grass. He's like wearing a $1,000 shirt right now. He's not going to do that to his t-shirt anymore. So 
I like Imp has to prove himself. Okay, I'm I'm not gonna automatically say okay this is franchise player. You know he's gonna up the team. He has to prove himself. Yeah, but here's the thing, man. I mean, if you're a losing team, everybody Mystic's looks sitting sad. behind him, Rez. But look, look, look. Mystic look. is sitting behind him. I think he, Mystic is sitting ahead of him. Yeah, he has to be sitting ahead of him. My point is that Imp will see playtime. That's my immediate gut feeling. He will see playtime. And it's, I don't think Imp looked a bad necessarily on LJD because if you're losing every goddamn game, everyone looks bad, right? The only player that I looked to on LJD and said that they were performing well would be Jinu is an easy one. Imp had great games and actually was, especially on the Ezreal pick, Ezreal was his go-to and he had some like excellent uh, games that he was coming up across on that one. And I say some because of course it's going to be consistency on a team like that. And then when they were finding sea legs, I would say Yuki sometimes. But then when he doesn't perform, they're putting in Nanju, right? So I would say Imp is a very clear AD carry you put, bring in and say if you put him in a right environment, he's a goddamn good AD carry. So WE for me, consistency is going to be a problem. You're going to be running Pepper a few games because he's expecting him to play games. Or at least if Condi doesn't find C legs because he hasn't had a split of play, yeah, you're going to put in Pepper. And the same goes for Imp. So right now, you're, my biggest thing is that you have a lot of players and I wonder how they're going to utilize them because at the beginning of the split, I don't expect them to roll in consistency, especially if they start losing a few games. Well, we'll have to keep yeah, track so of bottom line Team WE, especially because Team WE, big changes. Yeah. We thought they were going to be a big powerhouse for them coming into the last split. Now with their changes, hopefully it's going to beat them up coming into the summer split because they look so good. They were one of the favorites coming out of a semifinal finish. Had balls last year. We thought they would do well. Unfortunately, they had some team problems and they do well during spring break. What is your final say on that, Clement? It's just bottom line. These are the biggest moves of the offseason, for sure. Condi, uh, Pepper, and Imp joining W. Those are the biggest names. And it's just, it's just a matter of time and how they settle. Well, let's see how they settle. But let's move on to a couple of the other teams in the LPL. For OMG, Fire Lolly. He's retired. Apparently, he is going to be gone, but OMG still have as many junglers as they can pick up. The only requirement if you want to be a jungler in OMG seems to be you must be able to play Lee Sin from time to time as Mountain is going to be picked up by OMG. And I'm so glad to see my boy moving over here. Uh, Mountain, of course, came from the LMS region. He said publicly that he really missed Karsa. There was nobody to challenge him in the jungle anymore. And now he's here. He's chasing after the, uh, chasing after that legacy. Now, I actually have a, a couple of very controversial opinions on Mountain. I've said this publicly before, but I think Mountain actually has higher highs than even Karsa did. Like, he's known as the bandit. He will go and contest you at every, every single buff. And he's also a much better player when it comes down into those tank metas where you can use that Cinder Hulk. So I'm really excited for him to join OMG. And I'm excited for OMG's top side now that they can be a lot more aggressive. Ooh, I mean, does that mean that we're going to potentially see Mountain go up against uh, SOFM, both of them just fight each other for every single camp on the Rift? Well, SOFM doesn't really fight you. He kind of steals your stuff while you're, you you aren't there. But I want to see him against Flawless. Like, that's the big one for me. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be good. That's going to be good. I'm, I'm going to like that. And I'm going to be sad when I realize the next patch is, like, legitimately just... You ain't fighting for camps. You're just literally ganking to level two, level three, level four. It's like, that's my biggest fear <laughs> at the end of the day is that no jungle is going to meet each other unless if they find themselves at a level disadvantage because of whatever happened in level two. So like, that's, a, that's a small thing. That's me getting tilted off the patch. But uh, yeah, I, I think that you add in Mountain. And the biggest thing is that it's Mountain, but also I think Icon will do well in this patch. Uh, I think that OMG with the new 2v2 mid lane and a lot of the meta being based around mid lane pressure, ganks, vision control, That'll do OMG good. So I just hope that they find consistency. I know that when they even when they had Fire Lolly, you're right about the merry-go-round of jungles. That if one player didn't perform, if Jeko didn't perform, they just put on Fire Lolly. If Fire Lolly didn't perform, well, guess what? World six, you're back. So uh, yeah, OMG is still opening their options, but their windows are closing. If they want to find themselves at Worlds or contesting for it like they did last year, um, then you know you you have to find consistency in your lineup. Yeah, because the most consistent thing about OMG was their inconsistent roster changes throughout last split. We'll have to see if they're able to find form because we know that the morale was still high. They moved to their stadium in Chengdu. The team was still happy. The players were still happy, but they just weren't able to find any form during the spring split and had a very disappointing start to this year's LPL tournament. Moving away from OMG, Suning. Knight looked fantastic last split. It looked like one of the star players for the squad, but unfortunately, it seems like he's going through a couple of issues, Raz. Yeah, so even the Suning Gaming Weibo 
they meant a message that he won't necessarily be playing the beginning of the split. So, like, that is my question because it's not as if they don't have mid laners on the team. Uh, last split, or at least last year, they had yeah, Fen Fen and I, Dien. And right now, Suning, their secondary team in the LDL, they have Dien. And right now, they have Fen Fen on the main lineup. And we know what that team looks like. That's a that's night and day on what that team does. So, Fen Fen is literally a defensive player. He goes on the Galio pick, and that's the most you'll find use out of him. Uh, and it is a very mid lane stacked league here. So if you are not going to be a playmaker, then you're going you're gonna to have to play a defensive role. So that's what I'm worried about when it comes to Sunning Gaming, is that they don't have their rookie. of oh, I mean, my rookie of the year. I know Frost, she ain't here. But Frost could <laughs> say that, you know, Yagao is her rookie of the year. But definitely Knight is going to be having a little bit of issues in terms of getting in the game. And I really do hope that he comes in because uh, Knight has been a fantastic player to watch last split. And it would be a shame to not see him play. We just really want to see Knight play. Just to give a bit of background on him, he's our premier assassin player. He's currently in the rank one position on the KR servers right now, denying Faker from that seat. And uh, he plays a lot of things like the LeBlanc, the Echo. And I really want to see Suning continue to progress because they actually had the strongest early game in the LPL. It wasn't Invictus Gaming. It was actually Suning Gaming. And th they did that because they had all three lanes that could win their lanes and be superstars and they had hacker who could control the jungle as well so if knight manages to stay on suning this is one of those teams that we feel given time could really go into the upper echelons like compete with guys like edg compete with guys like blg and be one of those uh, stable playoff teams well, we give all our best to both Knight as well as Suning. Hopefully those issues are able to be resolved because you really want to see this player play, especially on the Suning roster that looked so close to making it into playoffs and were only taken down by their rivals of Jindong at the last minute. The very last game is what oh. it came down to. The Suning will be looking for revenge moving into this next split. Now I want to talk to you guys about who you think the Dark Horse team of the LPL is going to be because for me, this time around, it's going to be Rogue Warriors. And quite simply because it's a new patch, there's a lot of big changes, and Rogue Warriors always go against the grain. They go always go against the meta and find a new way to, you know, innovate, so to speak, going into every single split. They did that last split by protecting us from Aussie as hard as they could, almost took them all the way to a finals match. They ended up taking third, taking out a Victus Gaming at the third and fourth placing match. This split with all the changes, I expect their coach to be able to change something again, find a way to break the meta, and that could be the difference that propels them ahead moving into cross-conference and potentially into playoffs as well. But I want to get your thoughts first, Raz. Who is your Dark Horse team? All right. Easy for me, FPX. FPX is a damn fun team to watch. Remember, at the end of the split is when they got cool, right? You get cool on your team, and suddenly, like, you heard their comms in some of the uh, LPL videos that they were sharing at the end of it. The comms were so much cleaner when it came with adding cool. He's a talented player still. He's a massive upgrade from Bing. And also adding in the jungle. So now this is going to be, like, you, you're talking about controversial opinions. Like, Pepper used to be the heart and soul of that team. And moving on to WE, you would expect that to be... Uh, problem for fpx but they added sinye and people will be asking who sinye is he was in the lpl once before playing for jingdong he was alongside kabe he was alongside uh doonby in the mid lane and he was just a really like he wasn't a talented mechanical jungler like pepper but he was more methodical and i think that's what this team needs because they don't need more stars on this team they have enough stars they have cool now right you have the jungle, you have a Gungun top lane, and you have LWX bottom lane. You just need to get these stars ahead. And a lot of the times at the beginning of the split for FPX, they found losses because Pepper was a coin flip player. Like, a lot of times he was losing Gimgun lanes just because of how he was pathing topside, and Gimgun was getting consistently punished based off the fact that the 2v2 just wasn't there. So I think that if you find more consistency on this team, this team will start picking up wins. And so that's why, with questions on WE's roster problems and now you're talking about FPX starting to maybe iron that out. I think that placement's the difference between 5th and 4th on Western Conference. Yeah, it really does come down to WE. And uh, overall, I'm not... I, I don't see them moving massively up. I still think they have a lot of problems Ooh. in their other carry players like LWX and like Kim Goon because their play is incredibly uneven. Now, FPX is... When they're good, they look amazing. But when they're bad, do they look bad? So... You know, it's wait and see for me, but I, I'm not I'm not really on that hype train, I would say. Well, it makes sense, though. Fun plus Phoenix 
as a dark horse team, they have to consistently look the highs that they've always looked when they are playing incredibly well and avoid the lows that we know they can crop up. But what is your thoughts, Comedy? You mentioned Team WE. Is that your dark horse? Because a lot of people were thinking Team WE oh, no, 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 as no. a dark horse team. Yeah, I was thinking that too. What is your dark horse team moving to the next I split? So, okay, this is my answer for, like, playoff implications, but I think VLG is going to be, like, your your steady third-place team coming into the LPL right now. I think they're going to push EDG down a notch. And the reason for that is that um, it, it really started happening in the previous split as well. You saw that consistent uptick, that eight-game win, eight game win streak and going into playoffs. And in Dimashia Cup, they got over Rogue Warriors with their top lane, amazing jay playing the singe being the streaker in the meta i think they are at the point where they have they we used to call them the platypus where their pieces didn't make sense but now they have a really clear-cut identity they're the best engaged team in the lpl they have that from rogue from amazing jay they also have i would say the second strongest mid jungle duo in mole and chieftain for that early game as well they really covered up so many of their weaknesses and if you talk about the late game hyper carry, Jinjiao doesn't have to play the late game anymore. They're, that they're kind of isn't a thing. <laughs> so I, I really do see Billy Billy Gaming shooting up and kind of cementing themselves as third in the LPL. Yeah, I'm just going to hit this one just to say that I want to see BLG roll with Chieftain and Mole a lot more frequently. I want to see them just kind of that be their consistent pairing. I know that they're bringing in Mianhua from the LDL as their jungler so they can utilize Athena. So, like, that exists. That's a 2v2 that exists. And they ran it in Demacia Cup. And I just felt like, and you saw them change to Chieftain and Mole at the end. That is their stronger 2v2. That's what they should be coming into their championship season with. The other game will be playing in the opening game of the LPL. Uh, so one of the opening games of the LPL up against Vici in this second best of three series right after JD take on Invictus Gaming. So we'll have to see how those dark horse teams from our analysts do throughout the rest of the split. But when there's dark horses, there's always a couple of players that watch up, which are going to be the players to watch in the LPL. I want to start with you, Clement. Who are the players that you think that we should be watching out for moving into summer split? So I'm really high on the rookies of the LPL. Like, I really want to pay more attention to how Yagao is going to shape up and how Knight is going to shape up because these are going to be franchise players in the future going forwards. And for Yagao, I think, to give a short introduction, he was the most banned player of the LPL in the spring split. Like, no other player took as many bans as he did. And why I feel like he's going to be uh, uh, one of those uh, fundamental players that you have to know about the LPL is that he has that diversity for him to grow up into. His three most played champion were Azir, Zoe, and Galio. And they occupied very different spaces, and he was good at all three of them. So for me, I want to see how this player really cements himself in one of those categories, or can his team and his coaching staff kind of keep up with his diversity and have a good draft around him? Because that was one of the big issues in playoffs. Like, they they had Yagao on one of those three big champions, but they could not change the team around to fit those composition styles. So I think if I look at the future, I think Jingdong and Yagao have the most growing to do and they have the most potential to do so. Your thoughts, Raz? Not only on the players that are coming here, I think it's going to be watching, especially Yagao in the mid lane, who we thought was going to be a big impact for last split. He was a big impact for his team. Now is going to be a player to watch moving into the next split. Who are your players, Raz, that we should be watching out for? Yeah, I think with Yugao, if it comes down to getting more comfortable, finding leadership, that that's a big thing when it comes to that team. And I think that could be a point down the line. I think for me, when it comes to leadership, Condi is the name that comes to me. Because Condi either comes in and he flops, or he comes in and he comes back to being the best jungler in the league. For me, there's two, like two ways about it, whether he's still practicing or not, whether he has confidence in his play. A split can do a lot for you. Or you can just be like Uzi and a split means nothing. A split and not playing means you just come back and you smash. So for me, with Condi, I think that he is going to be a player to watch where I want him to come back and uh, kick people in the head. And I think that he can do that. So I want to see what he can do in week one. And if it doesn't pan out, then maybe WE ships him out for Pepper. And that's going to be the fire that lights him. So I, I really, really want to see what happens there. Oh, man. Raz, I see what you're doing right here. You're placing two bets at the same time. Like, if Condi doesn't work, then FBX for sure is going to go up, and that fills your black horse 
Uh, hey man, I'm not saying prophecy, doesn't it? I ain't saying Pepper, really man. Smart. I don't think <laughs> I think Pepper hits the ceiling. Like I think Pepper hits the ceiling because he's not a cerebral player like Condi. Condi is a cerebral player. He's uh, a player that can fit the mold of the team. And so for me, if Condi doesn't pan out and you bring in Pepper, then WE as a team doesn't have a high ceiling. Yeah, well, we'll have I'm to keep saying, track of Condi. You got both sides of the bed covered. <laughs> I mean, it's Raz. Flip flop. Wait know? a minute. That's this cool. is, that hold right? on a minute. Wait a second. This is called player to watch now, not player to bet. I'm not betting on a man to succeed. I'm saying just watch this man if he thrives <laughs> or if he falls. Man, I'm just saying this guy means it's WWE's out of playoffs or they're going into the top three. I mean, it makes I sense. That, I mean, I these agree. these these are good players to watch. Yeah, Cal, especially Pepper and Condi, good players to watch. But we have to look at some of the veterans as well. I mean, with the shy potentially coming back into a big game, rookie having a great split, only faltering during playoffs those are two players i think that are going to be crucial to watch and uzi i mean come on this man from not being able to win a single domestic or international tournament he's racking up the trophies now we have yeah. to continue watching and see if this man's going to continue snowballing yeah 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 you know this guy's already yeah, and i think he has the meta to do it you're right i like the guy man the guy you has a lot of rings. season four illusion he has three rings okay i wouldn't i wouldn't call that a lot but that's a lot in a short <laughs> time is actually this is a short I mean, time, he, dude. He, he went, uh, he yeah, went so in two months. <laughs> he went so long without picking up a single title, and now finally, and there was not only no, he picked up another 1v1 title at All-Stars, brought home the trophy for the LPL All-Star team, went straight back into the domestic split. He was able to pick up a trophy there, went to MSI, won his trophy. We have to keep track of this man. We're going to have to see how Uzi plays. We expect him not to be playing for the first couple of weeks of the LPL, and Abel will be taking his place while he trains and allowing RNG to experiment with different strategies, experiment with, with, with some of the new players as well. But we'll have to keep track of him. He's definitely going to be my player to watch, and I think a lot of people will be having their eyes on Uzi and seeing how he progresses as a player because there are some thoughts and some um, mentions about him potentially being one of the best players, well, if not the best player in the world at the moment. Now, with that in mind, final thoughts, gentlemen, on who you think is going to win the LPL, which team is going to take it this year? You go first, Clement. You take it. You want to go first? Nah. Uh, I think the momentum is just on RNG's side. I'm going to go with RNG all the way, and I think their biggest challenge is going to be IG with the shy in a healthy condition. But if... Even if, like, if the Chai comes back healthy and stuff like that, I, I still give my, uh, I still think RNG is going to take it. I think Karsa has grown up tremendously throughout the entire split, even compared to his LMS form. And I think they're just on a plane where uh, they trust each other. The synergy is good. They've had that success. They tasted it together. And RNG has always been known for being a momentum team. And if they have that achievement on them, I think they're always going to come out in a high gear. So RNG is going to be my pick. Look at this guy. He's hitting emotions way too hard, man. I'm hitting players. So you're right. You mean you, you, you hit your counter yeah. argument already. I'm putting it. IG as taking first place. And it's going to be on based off Ooh. skills. So, so IG, last time around, you already made a mention of it. The shot wasn't playing, right? It was just the Duke. The Duke. Yeah. The Duke. And it's a completely different style when you run in Duke. A lot of the times there were problems with his split pushing. It didn't happen. Or if it was team fighting, the communication just wasn't there. The Shy is uh, the best top lane uh, carry right now in the LPL. And you could say the world easily because Kai ain't performing too well in the MSI either. So I would say that IG just has the players to boot. Top lane going up against Let Me. And if we're just talking about the two teams going up against each other, the Shy will be able to take it. If we're talking about laning phase there too, then Rookie as well. The only real contesting point is going to be in the bottom lane. But if we're talking just like legitimately more talent around your roster, if we're talking about LeBron James going up against the entirety of the Golden State Warriors, right now Invictus Gaming are Golden State, and they're going to be able to take it. I don't know, Rez. I mean, you look over the side of RNG. Yes, Yahoo didn't have a good start to the split, but he finished that split so strong, and he was a really good mid laner in MSI. Casa fitting in with, with the team. Well, MLXG is still a coin flip that time. Sometimes you get the MLXD, but he still looks all right as a jungler. But Uzi and Ming stepping up, it kind of almost felt like if you were to put RNG up against Victus Gaming with the Shy at full form right after MSI, day after MSI, it almost feels like IG's only winning point of the map was going to be that top lane. Perhaps. I mean, look, top lane yeah, is a not... big thing. Uh, I would say that it depends a lot on what RNG is going to be rolling out because for the majority of the playoffs, they're rolling out with MLXG and Ning is just a, a more cerebral player than MLXG. Could be a contesting point if you run in Ning versus Karsa, but we already saw that during the regular season uh, near the end of it where IG just 
absolutely thrashed RNG based off the 5v5. And it's not going to be just as easy as that alone. In fact, if we're recalling what happened in the playoffs itself, it went down to five games regardless. It went down to the fifth game when Duke was just playing out. So if you're just talking about adding one more piece to the puzzle, <laughs> that is going to be enough to take a single game. Well, let's see if that's going to be enough for Invictus Gaming. Clement, final thoughts on who's going to win the LPL? Uh, I'm still going to go with RNG, but I do agree that the side lane is going to be tremendously important, and the stylistic matchup why IG is favorable in the regular split is because once they get the shy rolling, they shut down RNG's 1-3-1. RNG is kind of, kind of lost once they lose that top lane so hard. But I would point to two points on the map, and if IG are going to succeed, like you said, I think it's going to have to be Jackie Love really stepping up. He did not look terribly good in playoffs. That's true. It's also going to have to be Ning finally finding synergy with Rookie. Because if we talk about the meta, the most important two points in the early game is about the mid-jungle synergy and taking over those scuttles. Now, that's something that if I wanted to point a flaw to IG, would be, uh, would be Rookie and Ning. Those two in the 2v2 have never been the greatest duo. Despite their individual talents being up there, they really haven't. Uh, they they really have this weird thing between them where they just they just fumble the ball a lot of the times when they play 2v2. So those are my big two big concerns for IG, and that's why I'm still going to go with RNG. Well, it seems like those are going to be two contested teams, Victus Gaming as well as Royal Never Give Up, the two giants from last week going into Summer Split. Let's see how they fare. But gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. That's all the time we have for today's podcast. That was Cohen Chu, and was, as well as Brenta Raz Muhammad. If you guys enjoyed the podcast, please let us know in the comments. Tweet at LPL English. Let us know what you thought, what you'd like to see, what you didn't like. We can change things around. If you have any major complaints, we have set up a Twitter channel for your major complaints. I believe that is at, uh, let me read that right, at Razzleprasm. Any complaints Wait. can go to at Razzleprasm. Let that Twitter channel know and he'll be able to fix <laughs> all your problems. Up. But thank you guys. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time on the last podcast left.